the Social Work Bubble Podcast. I am your host, Laura. I'm a licensed clinical clinical social worker here in the great state of New York. Um, I have my own practice, Inner Compass Psychotherapy. The PLLC filing is still processing, so we're not officially that yet. I'm just practicing under my name, Laura Swanson, LCSW. Um, But in the future... In a few months, hopefully, I will be in our compass psychotherapy. Woohoo! Um, my website will be below, so you can check it out. Howdy, everyone. It's been a minute. The month of September was crazy. Um, but that is neither here nor there. Actually, it is a little here because one of the reasons I have been slacking on the good old podcast is. Me, my friend Emma Yeager, who was on this podcast only a few episodes ago, we are um, in the works, in the process of launching the Social Work Neighborhood Mentoring Program for social workers, um, whether it's professionals, early in the field, seasoned professional, social work students. Um, it's actually launching October 14th. I'll have information in the podcast description. We are having a block party on Monday, October 14th, 8 to 10 p.m. You can just drop in any time during that two-hour frame. It's kind of like a meet and greet, get to know everyone, get to know the program, see what it's all about. It is completely 100% free. We did not want to have another added cost, another resource for social workers that cost money. Um, and we are actually in the process of filing as a nonprofit organization. So in the future, we will really be funded solely on donations and grants. Um, so go ahead, check out socialworkneighborhood.org, register for our block party if you're interested, applications for mentees and mentors open on Monday, October 14th, so if you're wondering why I've been at MIA, it's because we are working on this super exciting, awesome program that I think will hopefully fill in the gaps for a lot of social workers and students. Um, it's not supervision, it is not consultation, it is mentorship. So feel free to check that out. I hope to see you at the block party. I hope to see you be a mentor or mentee. Um, aside from that, I've just <laughs> just been a busy bee, I guess. Um, today, today, we are going to be getting into what side hustles social workers can have, um, which, you know, I feel if you're talking about side hustles, because it's like, man, we really should just be paid better, generally. But I think most people in this economy have to have a side hustle, regardless of the industry that they're in. Um, kind of some logistic questions about how do you find an office space, if you want your own office space. Uh, using AI for notes in session. And... How to explain to people what you do, (laughs) which I think is a really fun, a really fun thing to dive into because the only thing I think about is that one trend of telling people that you're an accountant, (laughs) which is really funny. So we're going to be getting into it. Uh, Before we do, feel free to like, please share, follow the podcast, share it with a social work friend, a therapist friend, a mental health professional friend, a social services friend, any of your friends, an academia friend. Um, you know, follow me on Instagram. Uh, oh, this actually reminds me. So my Instagram account used to be just the social work bubble because I had my Etsy shop. I had this podcast. I was looking into maybe adding some other things. Now that the social work neighborhood is launching and I have my own private practice, uh, the social work bubble is just the podcast. It is only the podcast. So the Instagram is just about the podcast. I've even changed it to be just the social work bubble. Uh, in the future, probably in the next couple weeks, I will be making an account for just me, myself as an individual therapist, which originally was how my social work bubble Instagram account came about. But keep an eye out for that. Anyways, blah, blah, blah. That's a whole bunch of whatever. Uh, let's get into this first Reddit question concern from 
crank dat lex in r slash social work. Um, they say, I currently work full time as a therapist at a rape crisis center. So it's safe to say I'm pretty drained most days. That being said, I need some extra money. What does everyone else do as a side hustle? Uh, before I answer, I am actually going to go through some of the responses here already and kind of see what other people are saying. So one person says, I picked up 10 hours a week consulting at a dialysis clinic in a skilled nursing facility. Um, one person says, I recently signed up to be a local coordinator for a foreign exchange student program. It pays 70 per kid per month. Um, you have to talk to the child and host parents each month and do conflict resolution. That's interesting. That's like an extra few hundred dollars per month. Uh, one person is finishing up apprenticeship for doing eyelash extensions. Uh, one person is pet sitting. Someone is bartending. Another person works part time as a foster parent trainer. Home studies are six hundred dollars a home study, and the classes are between four hundred fifty dollars for four classes and nine hundred dollars for nine classes. Oh, whoa, that's very interesting. Um, another one is coaching toddler soccer and refereeing for littles. That's cute. Um, someone else said when I needed cash, I did Uber. So that's also cool. Someone here says, kind of getting at what I said earlier, the hustle culture is terribly unhealthy. If a full-time draining job isn't paying a living wage, I would find a better paying job. If you must stay at this current role, I would do something super benign, like walking a neighbor's dog. Um, here's the thing. I agree, like, hustle culture is terribly unhealthy, but this is also the world that we live in. And I do think, I talk a lot about operating as a collective in social work and when we are able to come together and not take the jobs that are lowballing us or giving us too many clients it is really important to like collectively reject those things. However, I think for many people, we are kind of in that survival mode of, I got to put food on the table. I got to provide for myself and my family. You do what you got to do. So as much as like, I, th I think we just have to hold both. That like, yeah, it's not healthy, but it is what it is. <laughs> we still have to live. Um, I, I do like what this person is saying though, is like doing something benign. Cause I think that's also what crank that Lex is getting at is they work at a crisis center. So they're very drained. With that being said, I don't think, I don't think it's super wise in terms of burnout prevention, self care wise to do a side hustle that is then another social work role. I think that is an easy way to burn out extremely quickly. Um, unless for some reason it's like something that can like pay the big bucks. So for example, I've seen a few people who maybe work at a nonprofit full time and then they have a private practice where they see a few clients during the evening or, or other times during the week. Um, and so they end up making maybe a couple thousand dollars a month because you can really honestly make bank in private practice. Um, now that is another social work role that is still draining. Um, and then of course it would just take up more time and it would be like being a therapist or something. I think a lot of social workers and therapists to make money have been getting into the coaching world, including myself. Uh, part of inner compass psychotherapy is I am offering individual mindfulness coaching sessions. So I've been on a mindfulness journey for a while and I'm cocky enough to feel like I can coach somebody on it. Um, and coaching is, let's keep it, it's not for mental health diagnoses and it's not covered by insurance. Um, and anyone can be a coach. Uh, you can literally just walk off the street and become a coach for somebody. Um, I tend to lean on people that either have a lived experience, um, or like some kind of professional background, like people that are therapists, but then also offer coaching because even though it's not for a mental health condition or something like that, they still have really valuable skills that overlap with coaching and can be really effective. Um, but again, those are all side hustles. Um, I say those things because I think coaching and private, like private practice, even on a very, very small scale, like a couple of clients can 
you can still make really good money there. Um, but I think generally, um, getting a side hustle that is not social worker therapy related can be really, really valuable for making sure that you feel like you're living a full life that is not just revolving around social work. Um, I do, I mean, I, I guess my first side hustle was the social work bubble, um, and the Etsy shop, which, especially a few years ago, it was, it was bringing in the money, probably like, a f- I, it would depend on the month, obviously, but like a, a few hundred to like a thousand, at least a thousand dollars a month, um, that was in the heyday. I've, the Etsy shop is now shut down and everything because it was just, it was too much to manage on top of everything else. But I also think Etsy shops are something that's really valuable. I got into doing that because I was looking for a side hustle. That's when I was living in New York City. I was getting paid a lot less, like 30 bucks an hour when I was working in community mental health. Um, and so I needed something that was more like that passive income idea, even though passive income is never really passive, um, unless it's like investing, but even then it takes a little work to like understand what the heck you want to invest in and all of that. Um, but something I've seen and it can feel a little oversaturated, but find something that you love. It could even be just fully digital goods. Uh, you could start getting into stickers. Um, I think a huge, huge opportunity for people is any kind of like mental health awareness or therapy products. I am always obsessed with, (laughs) I will always buy. And I really wanted to get into that for a little while, but I'm not an artist and I just didn't, I just didn't really have the bandwidth or wasn't a priority for me really to get on that, but I love seeing like mental health stickers. I will always buy a mug. Uh, I do think something to remember with with that stuff though is like, it is work and it is another job. And I do think that if you actually want to make money on it, you have to put in the time and the effort to make products that are quality and that like are cute. (laughs) People will actually want to buy. Like if you're wanting just to make a quick buck, it's probably not going to happen Um, but I do think like fully digital products, like on Etsy, that's what I did. I sold workbooks that were digital downloads. Um, you can even sell just like digital templates that people can download for really anything. Um, Etsy is also pretty good at letting sellers know like what things are really trending, what, what things will be kind of an uptick in the coming seasons, like a wedding season, um, changes of the weather season. So that's something I also think, I mean, just the typical stuff of like bartending, waitressing, that is definitely not less emotionally, um, heavy, um, like that, that can also be obviously incredibly draining because you're still working like direct customer service work. Um, I love the idea of like a dog sitting, house sitting, even babysitting situation if you have the capacity for that. Um, cause that's also stuff where I'm also thinking for people that maybe if you have your own pet or you have kids of your own, being able to like tack on someone else's, I don't think it's a huge shift in lifestyle and it gives you a few extra dollars. Um, Something that I did, oh, I always forget that I did this, but I used Wise Ant to do tutoring for social work students um, for a while. You can set your own rate and it's just a platform where people can like find you to do tutoring. I think tutoring is always something where it's always a need. It's always something that's out there. Um... And so that can be great. I know some people specifically get into tutoring for like the social work licensing exam, or as I said, keep it separate from social work. If you have a particular thing that is just like a hobby or an area of interest, like study up and offer your tutoring skills, um, which can be great. I'm also thinking like even offering to like maybe do like drop off or pick up for a family, like taking their kids to and from school or sports or something like that, I guess... (laughs) It'd be like a personal Uber service. Um, Yeah, another, this is a side note, uh, a sort of side hustle-y thing I'm doing is I have this app called D-Scout, 
And it is just like doing surveys and answering kind of questionnaires and survey questions. But uh, most of how you answer is through like selfie style videos. And I mean, some of these are pretty good. Like you can, you can make like a few hundred dollars a month if you are pretty diligent. And it also depends on if you qualify for surveys or anything. But I do that here and there and, you know, make a few dollars. That's pretty good. Let me actually just check to see. Let's see, I've completed eight missions since I joined in 2024. Does it say? It says somewhere how much I've made. Hmm. I've earned $284. One survey in particular, it was a few days and a few different things you had to do, was $145. That was the big one. And then here and there, like sometimes they're just like really fast. It's like $10 here, $7 here, $2 here, but they're just surveys. Um, so that's something that I like because it's also, it's pretty easy. Again, it depends on if you qualify for a survey, but I've done survey stuff before and it's always just those super annoying, like, oh, you get points or you get like a gift card. I'm like, I don't freaking want that. I want you to PayPal me. Um, and Dscout does that. So I, it sounds like I'm being sponsored by them. I'm not. I actually just like their app and I found, I found it in a recommended thing of like, side hustles or something because that was also I got started in that during my transition to my private practice and when I started using headway for my insurance billing and credentialing when you start with headway um, you don't get paid until 60 days after you start like are you um, able to start seeing clients and so I had tried to plan it out with me leaving the group practice job and being out on my own financially, but it just, (laughs) it was rough. It was rough during those 60 days to just like make sure I had the finances in order. So, you know, I made a few hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars there. Um, so that's a big long tangent on side hustles. Um, I also just think like put your feelers out there. I think a lot of people are doing side hustles these days to get by. And for the most part, people want to support each other. Um, so I've seen people on Facebook do like the like personalized cups. Like if you have a cricket machine, crickets are insanely expensive, but you know, stuff like that or like getting into the t-shirt world. I will say all that stuff is also a risk. There's never a guarantee. Something that I think is really fun and could even be a stress relief is getting into baking, Uh, like baking bread. You don't even have to do like fancy cakes or anything, even though that's an option. Um, There are even some people I see that like buy grocery store cakes and just charge like for the redecoration of them or they use like a base like of a box cake um but again it's just like it's the labor it's the decoration so I've seen that from a lot of people everyone's in it the economy's hard inflation shrinkflation it's all it's all getting us so that's the side hustle woohoo um moving on We have, let's see, how did you find your office? This comes from Brave Brainiac. Hello, Southern California LCSW here. I am currently looking to expand my practice and meet with couples and families. I do not want to meet them through telehealth and am currently looking for an office. I am not having luck at all finding just a small square footage place. Everything I'm finding is like renting a whole suite and it's multiple thousands a month. But I just need a small couple hundred square foot office for the weekends. How did you find your office? Any help would be greatly appreciated. Thank you in advance. I want to preface this with saying I do not know everything. Um... Because I am a fully remote practice right now, I'm interested in having an actual office in the future because I I do prefer in-person sessions, but I like not having to pay for an office, and it's just more convenient right now in my life. Um, but there was a period where I looked into it, and this is going to be different based on where you live, but I do think, similar to getting a job, finding an office space is a lot of times can be just like on word of mouth 
personal network situations. So I'll give you an example. Um, my sister was visiting me in the small town that I live in. It's a very cute small town in central New York. Um, and we were going through all these different shops uh, downtown. And we ran into this lady who was part of kind of the tourism for the county. And I got to talking with her and I was like, yeah, I moved here last year. I'm really liking it. I'm a therapist. I'm thinking about opening like an actual office space, but I'm not quite there yet. And she was like, well, I'm really involved in the real estate space here and like what places are available. And, and she's just, she, she knows her stuff. And it was in that moment where, I mean, she also let me know I would be the only private practice in town, which is crazy. Um, and she just had a good idea about like what was available and what would make sense. Um, like, and, and kind of, and all of that. And I feel like that was really empowering and really affirming because I had done some looking online and it's just hard. You know, it's hard to visualize a space. It's hard to find spaces that are actually affordable and like the size that you want. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. So I think like connecting with people and even just like reaching out to people like real estate agents that are in the area, even if you are only leasing or renting a place, not even buying it, um, can be, can be, um, really, really helpful with that. Something I've been thinking about because during my internet search, I came across a couple of like commercial listings that were like, oh, we have a free room in this doctor's office or, oh, this building that has like this massage therapist here and this like other, I don't know, healthcare provider. We also have a room available. Um, I, I think part of that kind of leaning into the personal network piece is even getting onto like Facebook groups of where you live, connecting with other professionals, um, it could even, I don't know, even be your own healthcare professionals and kind of be like, hey, is there any like office space available here? I would only need it for the weekends. Because I'm also thinking like there are plenty of places around that are closed on the weekends and potentially could be open to a discussion about having you use the space on weekends. So it's something, it's something to think about. Um, I also think it's hard and I get not wanting to meet with couples and families over telehealth. It is really hard to do that, but I, you do what you got to do. You do what you got to do. I've also tossed around the idea, um, I think clients would have to sign an agreement that this is okay with them, that there is a risk of like being seen in public with you, thereby risking confidentiality. Um, But holding sessions in public spaces, like if it's, if it's a nice weather day, kind of being like, Hey, do you want to just like meet up at the park and we can chat on this bench? You know, I've been, maybe it's because I'm back living in a small town, but I have clients that still live and work in New York city and we often meet during their lunch break. So they go out and they sit on a park bench in central park and we, and we do their session over the phone and that's that's kind of what happens, you know? So I've been tossing around that idea. I saw someone on a Facebook group. She does forest therapy. I screenshotted it because I was really interested in maybe adding that to my repertoire. Um, But she has, she often does like walks in the woods and forests with her clients during their session. So like forest therapy, being out in nature is part of that talk therapy experience. And they also have to sign a waiver first for like insects <laughs> injury, like that kind of education there, but also like for confidentiality. Like there's always a chance you'll walk past another hiker or something. And that's something to be mindful of. But even if you live in, in climates, not like New York that are pretty nice weather all year round, I think that's something to think about because then you don't have to, you don't have to pay rent for a place and you can always find a quiet park and, and do your thing. (laughs) So I don't know, things to think about, things to think about. Um, this next one is about AI for notes. I already have some thoughts (laughs) and maybe... Okay, this is what I'm going to say. I'm not even going to read this prompt yet. I'm just going to say, no, I think it's a bad idea. But let me read this prompt. Uh, Recently, my company 
introduced us to Freed, an AI program that listens to your sessions and creates a note for you. I have yet to try it myself as I am a little uncomfortable at the thought of AI listening and writing a note for your client. Has anyone used Freed or any other AI program to help write notes? Uh, First of all, I just want to preface, I have not. And you know what? I will not. There's something about this that feels icky. And there's something about this that feels like it breaks confidentiality, um, or at least risks confidentiality. Having any kind of like third party software, even if it is something that is HIPAA compliant, makes me nervous. Um, and I also think regardless, Clients still have to consent to being recorded in session and to having something else listening and recording them. And I don't know if a lot of people would be on board with that right now. Um, I would take a guess that a lot of my clients, if even if they said yes, would be very, they would say yes to almost people please <laughs> and not necessarily because they fully consented to something like that. Um, This is something I probably need to do more research on before I actually form an opinion. Uh, I think AI can be incredibly valuable. I had an AI and VR episode a few episodes ago. Uh, I have since used ChatGPT a lot for the social work neighborhood and for the social work bubble, creating content calendars, giving me outlines for different ideas and projects. Like it, It is kind of like having a a virtual assistant in some ways that that takes some of the admin work out of your life when you're a business owner and when you're a therapist. Um, but I think I think the part that gets me is that this program listens to your sessions, and I just feel like and this is the thing. I know social workers were like we're on a time crunch. We are a apparently always behind on notes, even though I've gotten a lot better at that. And so I think, and the most positive light, it could be a good resource for social workers, but there's something about it that I don't think is fully ethical in terms of protecting our clients, because then I would also just, I would be worried about still that information, like if it's being recorded, where exactly is that being held? Who has access to that? What are the protocols in place? You know, like I just, it worries me. It worries me. So right now it's a no from me on the AI for notes. All right. The last one, because this episode is getting up to the half hour mark and I have a session in a few minutes. So let's, let's get going on this. How to better explain to people what I do. This comes from schnick underscore industries. Without giving away too much info about myself, I'm in grad school at a placement where I am not under real supervision. I'm basically an intern in a public setting that provides many services to the local community. That was the vaguest thing you could have said, my friend. (laughs) So I have people I work with, but nobody in the field of social work. Okay. At one of my placements, patrons often ask me what I'm doing there or just what it is I do. Keep in mind, it's more older people at this location. That's just the demographic. And I never say the right stuff. I just had one woman tell me I was very cute when I tried to explain. I meant to bring this up at supervision last week, but for, but forgot. And I'm at my placement for six and a half more hours. So I was hoping someone had insight before my day ends. Well, this is from two days ago. So um, I just, yeah, I will say... I think you're overthinking this. Um, At the end of the day, you are in grad school uh, at your field practicum, I'm assuming. You're saying at a placement. Um, Even though you say you're not under real supervision, your experience is supposed to be, I'm assuming, a social work graduate school practicum experience. That is what you can tell people. I'm a social work intern. You know, I'm a student. I am here to practice social work to practice the things that I'm that I'm learning in my education right now um now I mean if people are asking specifically what you're doing then you can express that even if it doesn't fully align with social work um you can just say I'm a social work intern uh right now I'm doing xyz can I help you with anything you know something like that so because I do think it's important for people to understand what we do so that way they can actually use us and come to us when there's something that we can support them with. Um, so part of it is not making you feel weird about, oh, I'm like not doing what I want to do. 
sometimes people just like don't know what you're there for and being able to let them know I'm a social work intern and putting that label on it can already open up the door for them to to come to you as they need to. So that's a little quick answer for that because I I think we're maybe overthinking it a little bit. All right, everyone. Well, that's it for today. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. Um, Hoping to get back into these weekly episodes and also get into bonus episodes. Um, So remember, you can subscribe and get access to bonus episodes that are similar to this. Um, And I'm trying to get those out every single week as well. Please give me some flexibility. You can also, I've had some people, you can like subscribe once. So like pay your five bucks or whatever. You also set the amount. I think automatically it says five bucks, but you can change that to whatever I think. Um, Listen to all the episodes you want to listen to and then cancel your subscription. Like it's not that serious. Um, It's just like a, it's a little thing that helps me, you know, keep having space and bandwidth for these episodes. Um, so yeah, like, share, follow me on Instagram, do your thing. And remember, don't forget, sign up to be a mentor or mentee. Um, if you don't want to do that yet, you can uh, stop by our block party open house for the social work neighborhood mentoring program, October 14th, eight to 10. I'll have the event registration below. It's completely free. I hope to see you all there and I will see you next week.